You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dillon and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. My name is Shagun Yedele. I am speaking to you today from Kelowna in the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan nations. And as usual, my co-anchor is Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Shagan. Co-anchor, that's a first. I love it. Um, it's a pleasure to join you here from uh, the Vancouver Point Grey campus on the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territory of the Musqueam Nation. Um, we have a fabulous guest here today, Margaret Moss, who uh, was a colleague here at UBC and has since moved. Margaret, welcome to the podcast. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you so much. So um, I'm Margaret Moss, and sure enough, I was at UBC for about five years, and I was the uh, director of the First Nations House of Learning and also a uh, professor over in the School of Nursing. My area, I'm also a um, enrolled member of the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota. That's the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara, and I have equal lineage in a Dakota First Nation in Saskatchewan. So my areas are nursing. I do have my PhD in nursing, and my area of inquiry was Indigenous elders. And then when I found out what I found out, <laughs> it occurred to me that it's policies and structural and systemic issues that are keeping uh, health status and outcomes down. So therefore, I then went to law school to try to figure out federal Indian law and uh, uh, the policies and things that happen, the historical traumas and things like this. So I kind of put both of those uh, professions together and look at health policy and see how we can try to raise the numbers up. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. And you've done tremendous work. You were one of the co-authors of the In Plain Sight report here in British Columbia, which really rocked the system. Um, I think it was a, a much needed wake up call for politicians, for healthcare professionals, for our students, for the university. Do you want to talk a little bit about this report and what you found? Sure. And uh, that name came at the end, and it was very obvious to us that that should be the name. There was no question. And so um, the report started because there were rumors that there had been. Um, it turned out this part, I think, wasn't widespread or, or, or true widespread, but it was called the Price is Right game in the ERs, which was um, if a if a indigenous person came into the ER, um, the staff would try to guess without going over their blood uh, uh, alcohol. Um, levels. And so that got out and became a thing. And so that instigated the report. That wasn't really borne out as a widespread thing, but so many other things were. So we had 9,000 people give input. There were 125,000 data points. And this is an almost 300 page report. And it found out over and over and over. I talked to um, nursing professionals who weren't indigenous, who were indigenous, indigenous people themselves, communities and members could call in, indigenous mostly. Uh, there were phone lines, email, you know, just all sorts of ways to get to us. And um, what they found was, I like to say, no port in the storm, basically. There's no safe harbor. So what we mean by that is from the minute somebody does, and it takes people a minute, they don't want to enter the system because they know what's waiting, that you can call the ambulance and you could get problems there. You could get to the ER and the clerks might treat you some kind of way. 
the nurse might make you wait and treat you another way. The, you know, um, if you go to the laboratory, if you go to radiology, everywhere you go, there's the chance that something's going to go awry. And so uh, when it does, often uh, indigenous patients are viewed as a problem. So if anything goes off, then you call security. Then security calls the RCMP, and then the person's taken away. So this is the healthcare system in many cases for indigenous patients. I remember there was one, one uh, case in there, and it's filled with people's stories, where an elderly man came in, and his hip was hurting, he couldn't walk, he was in terrible pain. But of course, everyone thought, oh, and I might not have all the details, but basically thought that... Uh, you know, he's drug seeking, he just wants a place to sleep or get some food or whatever it was. And he was adamant and they took x-rays, supposedly if I'm remembering this, didn't find anything. He's adamant, it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. And, and it, it did escalate to the point of calling security, calling RCMP, he went to jail. Next day came back cause he's like, it's really, I can't walk, you know, it's terrible. And now they did find a broken hip. He he had the broken hip the whole time, and he's thrown into jail. So, and then there's another one. I, I won't go into millions of them, but um, a woman who had like a, a brain tumor or something, and she tried three different times to come in, and people again think she's drunk, she's drug seeking, you know. And so she's like, I'd rather just have the brain. I'm just not coming. I'm just not coming back, you know. Um, unfortunately, one of the highest, it lists all these places that you can go, like a, a mental health, the hospital, the ER, the, the social workers, and so on and so on. And it turns out, actually, the social workers are one of the most feared, the ones they don't want, because they're still in place, the you're not a good parent, we're taking the kids, we're taking the baby, and this kind of thing. So many things, and this is current day, <laughs> you know, this isn't 1910 or something. Um, so it's a fascinating report. It's online. There's a smaller one at like 75 pages. There's a the bigger one that's almost 300, like I said, that's filled with these stories and 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 then finally some recommendations and so forth. But um, the thing, there's a several of these graphs. That was one of them that every single place you go, you get in trouble. This, another one is um, what they feel like whispering, make fun of, put down, think you're drunk, think you're drug seeking, you know, not a good parent, just this whole list of how people perceive how they're being perceived. And so the bottom line is people don't want to seek care. And so then when you seek it, you're in desperate shape usually because you don't want to go get care. I actually found very similar things in my work in the U.S., <laughs> And so, you know, in doctoral training, you have to come up with a mid-range theory, at least our school did. And I came up with something I called tolerated illness for the same reason. You ask an Indian elder, and I will vacillate between the various terms here, but Indian is actually still the legal term in the U.S. and in Canada. I know there's more PC terms, but I'll flip into that uh, a lot. And um, so you you find an, uh, a native elder and you'll say, how are you doing? You know, how are you feeling? And they'll go, oh, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> Even though they have a peritoneal dialysis bag, one eye and, you know, half a leg. And because they don't want to access the system. They, for a variety of reasons, some of them very similar to what was found in BC, others having to do with the cultural and spirituality aspect of being a person that cannot be accommodated in the healthcare system. Yeah, um, thanks, Margaret, for going over just um, your experience with that report. And there's thousands and thousands of stories and people that came forward. And, and, and my, my worry is that that wealth of information gets lost, you know, um, that people will look at it, at least it's not that it won't gather dust somewhere and just be put on the shelf somewhere, but that people will take this as a learning opportunity for change. Um, uh, you know, how do you think we can move forward 
uh, with with that report and, and actually make sure that the lessons that they highlight, that the report highlights are put to practice in our healthcare system. Well, many of the recommendations, it's been a while since I dusted it off myself, but uh, were for the government to change some things. And so I was part of the investigation team, as it was called, to get this report out. But I, but the Minister of Health did move to a um, the next phase. I'm, I'm not thinking of what they're calling it right now. Implementation, maybe, or something. There, there are different people who are now trying to help figure out how to um, get things in place uh, to help. And I mean, that's so important. And we do keep. In a life, I actually show a picture of the front page of the report uh, every time I present the case of a, a patient who had a stroke and has slurred speech. And I talk about how Indigenous folks, when they come in with slurred speech, are often um, assumed to be drunk and not right. assumed to have had a stroke. And I think there's a case just like that in the report as well. Um, and so, um, I mean, it, it has to start with the education and then the implementation as well. Mm -hmm. Margaret, I want to go back to something that you said about Indigenous folks not accessing the healthcare system. One, because of the structural racism and the way that they will be treated. But the other one intrigues me a lot, and I'd love to learn more about it, and that is how our Western healthcare system cannot accommodate the Indigenous person in their entirety, in their wholeness of being. Can you explain that a little bit to us? Sure. So, and again, there's no pan-Indigenous and, you know, there's varieties by region and tribes and nations and so forth. However, it is broadly held, as I've noticed for 34 years of being a nurse in Indigenous world, that um, people view at least Traditionally, if you're going back, and I work with the elders, so they're very traditional, and then there's other very traditional people, and then, of course, people live with the elders and the traditional people. So it's widely held that there are four domains to the person. The body is just one of those domains. So it is um, mental, spiritual, physical, and emotional. And uh, I was speaking to one elder um, maybe 10 years ago, but he gave me an exemplar, which always stuck with me. And he said, you can think of these uh, domains as the four wheels of a car. And if one of them blows, it's going to be a bumpy ride. And in Indian country, often two, three, if not all four tires are blown. And so you're just riding on the rims trying to get to the off ramp and get to some kind of safety. But then if you put that together with what I just told you, you think it's safe <laughs> or you need the safety of the healthcare system and then it falls down on you too. This is why there is high contemporaneous traumas along with the historical traumas coming together. And that's why we have some of the lowest life expectancies, the highest suicide rates, and then all the coping mechanisms that are unfortunately like alcohol, drugs, and uh, you know risky behaviors and so forth that make all the numbers even worse because nobody is taking care of those other three domains. So, I mean, I can tell you from the nursing perspective, we do teach if people would remember, <laughs> you know, mind, body, spirit, and so forth. It, it's in there. And so we're one of the professions that's probably the closest to indigenous thinking in this manner. We're actually taught this. And then at a higher level, we're taught the meta paradigms uh, uh, of nursing, which is the person, the nurse, um, health. And uh, of course, I forgot the last one. I think it's environment. Um, it is. And in indigenous thought, environment is part of health. It is absolutely part of health. And hardly anybody else thinks of this, but, uh, but as we know, so you get in the hospital, that's where most nurses are working, and it devolves to the gallbladder in 238, you know, you, you kind of, it all goes out the window, it's all nice, but then it goes out the window. But for the indigenous patient, it didn't go out the window. And so they can see that they're not really attending to it. So I'll give you my example. My dissertation was with a tribe, I won't name them because, just because, but it was a very traditional 
Pueblo in New Mexico. They mostly still speak their language. They were not Christianized. Um, they still do their traditional doings. Where I'm from in the plains across the north um, in the US, just as in Canada, you know, there were boarding schools, you could call them residential schools. There was the whole assimilation, the, you know, religion got beat out of you, the English got beat out of you, and so forth. So in some of these really traditional Southwest tribes, it it wasn't. They they still have thoughts and actions and everything they've been doing for you know 15,000 years. So anyway, I had worked in the uh, Santa Fe Indian Hospital in New Mexico, and I noticed that the elders would never let themselves be uh, discharged to elder care because, of course, there was no American Indian elder care on their reservations and so forth. Uh, so they would have to go to, this is New Mexico, Anglo, as they called it, or Hispanic care, and they just wouldn't. They they that's where they got the idea of tolerated. They'd rather go home and die. And they did. They they didn't want to have both the racism <clears throat> that you would find in border towns or even the big sitters like Albuquerque or the total misunderstanding or no understanding of their actual needs and that integration of the four domains of the person. So even though nursing is taught to have those different domains, including the environment. Um, it's the opposite. Even if they do do it, it's the opposite. So even in nursing, you'll take care of the physical person first. You might get re references to, you know, or referrals to mental health, where rarely does it get spiritual. And even if it did, nothing's in place. And emotional is rarely uh, thought about. For elders, the ones I took care of, the very traditional ones, it's the spiritual life first. It is last the physical body. So that's why uh, they would say I'm perfectly fine because if they could continue to do their spiritual and cultural doings, they are in perfect health. And it doesn't matter they have one leg and can't see out of one eye. And so although those four domains are there for both uh, groups, they're in opposite order. <laughs> Oh. All right. It's um it's a complete paradigm shift and a complete <laughs> different way of thinking and different way of being uh from the Western mindset. And um, you know, and to get to a question that uh, uh, Claudia was asking earlier, do you I know that in some hospitals and, and the way we teach our medical students here at UBC, we try to um, uh, uh, we're teaching, uh, teaching them cultural safety. Uh, we're teaching them uh, to be aware of the entire individual, the whole person and all of that. Um, but I don't know how good a job we're doing, frankly. My question is, um, how can, is there a way to integrate? Is there a way to, uh, to, uh, to practice safe um, uh, health care? with especially having the indigenous person uh, in mind um you know if you if, if you if you were to you know be given the task of developing a curriculum where we teach our students what are those things that you will like to emphasize yeah and in a way i did not there but in the u.s <laughs> in that you know i'd gone through three nursing programs getting your licensure master's phd nothing of any substance on American Indians or indigenous people at all. You know, they might say, oh, they don't look in the eye, which is completely ridiculous. And it, it varies from tribe to tribe. And there's rules to it, like an unmarried man might not look this person in their eye and, you know, whatever. There's no blanket they don't look in the eye. But that's the kind of silliness that you might learn. And so, um, and then I started teaching at several universities and nobody had anything. So I actually uh, published the first um, textbook for nursing, American Indian Health and Nursing. And I didn't, I didn't do it the usual nursing text, which is either by body systems or by lifespan. I did it by cultural regions because they are so incredibly different. And um, 
you really need to know what region you're in, whether it's here, whether it's Canada, and um, at least figure out, because over here there's 574 federally recognized tribes, about 60 some more state recognized tribes and so forth. You're never going to know all of it, but if you can know the cultural regions, at least that you're in, with shared geographies, histories, languages, and so forth, at least know where you are, <laughs> and then you can start to understand what the thinkings are, what the practices are. You know, some people smudge, some people don't, some people have cedar brushing, some people do sweats. You, it's not, it's not all the same. So if you at least know that, then you can advocate. So, for instance, at this, I haven't been here for a long time, but the University of Minnesota hospitals did have, for instance, a smudging policy. So if you needed a patient to smudge, you just had, you know, there's a policy, tell these people, they'll turn off the HVAC system over here and blah, 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 whatever, notify people. Uh, Some places, I think the veterans hospital here has sweats outside of it or used to. Um, things like that. You, you have to know what they want, but but that doesn't work, you know, in British Columbia. <laughs> In many of the tribes, they don't smudge and they don't, as I was told on my <laughs> at the at the longhouse, they're like, no, they don't do that. Um, so anyway, I, I did this text because there there wasn't any big understanding. And the thing that spurred me on to it was that I grew up urban, but I'm a plains person also across the northern plains, which is North Dakota and there. My tribes in North Dakota, and um, and then I went to the Southwest, like I said, to New Mexico. Complete night and day, night and day, completely different. I had no idea what I was doing, so I was just faking it. <laughs> you know, everybody expects you to know something because you're an Indian, but um, it, so my little example there is always I was um, helping somebody get ready to go to surgery. They were on the gurney, and you know, moving the sheet to make sure you know are the lines okay, is the jewelry off, and all that. And the woman was lying in bed with an ear of corn. And I thought, where did I learn this in nursing school? <laughs> you know, so I just kind of faked it and I asked questions later. And so there's the body, but then there's the spiritual body. And the corn represented the spiritual body. So the cob was the body, the silk was the hair, the husk was the clothes and so forth. And so while the person was out, the spiritual body can be watching over the body that's out. So there's so many of these things, so many of these things out there that you never learn, you never learn this. So I told all my contributors, because I don't know every area. Um, I mean, I worked in the Southwest, I know the plains, I know urban areas. Um, I told them, think of your sort of subtitle as what I never learned in nursing school. <laughs> and so that's how we uh, move that thing forward. That is such a beautiful story with the cob of corn kind of as the spiritual body that looks over the body having surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and that understanding of the continuity between all four sort of realms that you described in that um, understanding of the body. I wonder if this approach and this understanding of the body and the needs of a body doesn't that extend beyond Indigenous people? I think we all have those needs. Maybe we just, in our Westernized culture, haven't articulated it as clearly. And we're yearning for those same types of connections, for that spirituality, for that sort of holistic understanding of what it means to be human, to have a body, to live in an environment. Mm -hmm. um, so where, where can we transfer some of that wisdom um, to a broader culture without appropriation, obviously, but just in, in terms of sharing and uh, and learning. I think it, it applies to the broader uh, culture, the, the, what do we call it, the dominant culture, <laughs> uh, at the very least, to um, figure out what region you're in, once again. <laughs> so, um, I mean, where I am right now, a lot of Norwegians and Germans, and, you know, they have their food and way of thinking and religions and so forth, but go south and go to New Orleans, it's going to be completely different, whether no matter where you're at. And I think we just have the rudimentary nod towards spirituality. It's not, it's not huge, and I think it needs to be, in that um, 
if you do go to a hospital, you're likely to run into at least uh, Judeo-Christian opportunities. Maybe there's mass or a Christian offering on Sunday, and um, sometimes there's rabbis or priests or whatever on call, but rarely does it go beyond that. <laughs> and I think it needs to. I did one study um, on the importance of spirituality, how important it is to, but I was again in a very traditional, um, some tribes that were very traditional and elders. And um, even when it was a, an American Indian group that made this survey, um, that's why I say Indian isn't an Indian. It was given, and I took it to the Southwest, and people, I was more interested in the cultural and spiritual aspects of aging and so forth. And they came out almost zero, like it didn't matter. And I had done an ethnography and knew it was everything from the time they got up. They had to sprinkle cornmeal to, to the gods. They had the spirit bowls. They gave the food to the gods before they ate themselves for themselves and so forth. From dawn to dusk, it was all spiritual. Everything was sacred. Secular life was hardly known. It just was sort of by the by the wayside. So I knew it wasn't true. And the problem was, as I said, across the north, this survey came from North Dakota. As I just told you earlier, they had been Christianized and boarding schools and all this kind of stuff. So their questions around religiosity and so forth were, how often do you go to church? And how often do you do this and that, which were very christian -y things. And they didn't. They don't go to church. And I can't remember the other things. They don't pray in that way or whatever it was. I can't, I can't remember the questions, but they were very Christian-focused. So I, as as a, in my postdoc, <laughs> redid it. And from what I knew, questions that made sense from them, from the ethnography, said, you know, how often do you, or do you, do you um, sprinkle cornmeal every day, which is like their holy water almost? Do you uh, go to Shalico, which is this huge winter solstice thing? Do you go to the deer dances, this, that, and the other thing? And it was all, it was almost 100, it was like 95%. So not only were they religious, <laughs> They were uber religious. I think I think religious scales across the U.S. are like thirty percent. People are like thirty percent going to church regularly, and this kind of these people live it every day, all day. And so, if you were a funder or the government or whatever making decisions on what do these people need, you would think, oh well, they don't. You don't have to worry about that. No, you really have to worry about that. So it, these understandings are not very people. People aren't understanding that so interesting you really have to ask the right questions in order to get the right results and this connection between the spiritual and sort of the physical is so important i've been thinking about my grandmother as you were speaking and so uh, towards the end of her life she was in elder care but uh, she was in a lutheran elder care facility and she was catholic and then she got sick and she had to go to the hospital and it was a catholic hospital and then uh, she asked, she needed surgery the next day. And she asked, can I please have a cup of coffee today before the surgery? And they were like, really? Okay. And my mother was like, give her the coffee. And so um, she got her cup of coffee and she savored it. And her words, and I quote, were, it is so nice to have a good Catholic cup of coffee. Now, I don't know what the difference is between a Lutheran and a Catholic cup of coffee, but for my grandmother, this was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it really contributed to her sort of emotional and spiritual well-being going into that surgery, which I don't think she was supposed to have coffee the day before. But, oh, God. <laughs> you know, it was something that was so important to her. And that was really sort of tending to the whole person as opposed to just the person with some sort of bowel um, problem. Um, and so, you know, when we think about the needs of just being human, it often extends beyond the physical body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, <clears throat> again, when I was doing the first study of why won't they seek care um i was working with a group 
And well, it was very, like I said, a Southwestern traditional uh, Pueblo. And what I found out was because the spiritual thing took over, they have to be able to do, it's not like, and, and I grew up Catholic actually. So, you know, it's not like, oh, you might have done something. You like wrong. Catholic coffee this time? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not about Catholic coffee. And it's like, you could do something wrong, but oh, there's mitigation, right? Go to confession, whatever. Um, but for them, there isn't. You have to do these things. It's not you should, you must, or you're going to bring evil and badness on yourself, your family, the Pueblo could be the world. You you have to do these things. It's beaten into you daily. You, you have to do them. So the things that they had to do couldn't be done in a New Mexico nursing home. Nursing homes are run by states. They're licensed, regulated by states. And the two are not meshing. So what I found out was, especially the traditional men, the men were belong, belong to priest and medicine, Kiva groups for life. They're initiated in, in you know, their youth and it's a lifetime thing. So some of the things they have to do is go out early and pray when the gods and ancestors are flying around. Uh, they have to touch the actual earth every day, not tile, not carpet. They have to touch the earth. They have to fast with the lunar months and whenever the high priest calls for it. Um, they have to not do anything of the white world, which means you can't eat, you know, food prepared in factories in the U.S. or whatever. Um, whenever it's called for and during this time called Deshqui around the um, like Christmas time sort of. Uh, if you were to go by these Pueblos at that time, you wouldn't know they existed. You can't run lights, you can't run uh, engines, you can't uh, use money. You just shut down for X amount of days. So if you take this person, oh, and also they had these things called spirit bowls at the um, senior center, where when you get your plate of food, you decide how much are you giving to the ancestors and gods, and you put it in this bowl, and then the high priest will take care of it. So. Um, if you put this person in a nursing home, they try to go out early and of course the doors are locked and alarmed until day shift comes in. You try to burn the food out of your spirit bowl and, and you know sprinklers. You try to go out and touch the ground every day because you have to. And now you're wandering and confused. You, you refuse to eat during this holy time, which you don't necessarily want to tell these people about. But you can't do it. And out comes what force feeding in the syringe or whatever, because you, you're not eating for a reason. But people don't know it, and it's not necessarily that they're going to tell you what it's none of your business. <laughs> you know, it's, it's and so anyway, they literally. That's when I would hear those things at the hospital. They literally rather go home and die. If that's what it took because they need to have. They need to do the spiritual stuff more so than the physical stuff. Uh, yeah, and it just brings me back to where we started, uh, Margaret, which is the, how you described the absolute lack of trust you know, among indigenous people for um, Western medicine and to, to approach hospitals and so on. That's because at every turn, everything they would like, like to do and practice is just denied, you know, discounted, not recognized. and um, and. I think that's just very touching to me to say how we can, uh, we need to learn. I think that's one thing I'm taking away from all you're saying, that as as practitioners and as teachers and as people who are so much embedded into this Western style of medicine, we really need to listen and learn more than we talk. And and there's so much to learn from uh, if we if we would if we will have that humility to to listen uh, um and and that's really so important uh, otherwise it will just be continue people will never open up like you're saying somebody who really feels today i don't, I don't want to eat for whatever reason and yet there is like a prescription and they have to uh -huh. be force fed and uh -huh. and and um th there's so much there's such a long way that we have to go <laughs> you know um, as i see it oh. so margaret um well I, i'm just wondering if we, as we begin to round up our discussion today um and you um, i i think you have a lot of success you know from all that you've t you've told us today from 
your PhD, the work and the studies that you've done. Um, if you had to give us a, a word of wisdom in terms of how to, in, you know, be more open to uh, our indigenous uh, elders and and their wisdom, uh, what 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 would you say? How would you advise our students and people listening to to us today? Yeah, I tell whether I, I did teach the one mandatory course at the uh, School of Nursing there at UBC uh, for several years on uh, health promotion of Indigenous people. And, you know, towards the end of the some of the classes, we, we would go around the room and we did a um, talking circle to see how people felt, what they thought, what they learned, and what surprised them and all that. And we had several people in tears each time because they're like, we didn't know. We just didn't know. And, uh, and both here in the U.S., I've taught nursing forever and there, I tell people it's it's not your fault. It's by design you don't know. It's on purpose that you don't know too much about uh, Indigenous people. But now you do, so it's incumbent upon you to learn more. And again, you, as I said before, you can't know everything across this huge North America but if you know where you're working, <laughs> at least find out what are the nations there, what are their beliefs, what might they need. But first, what you have to do, and nobody, hardly anybody does this. I know I've been in the healthcare system as a patient, many times, four kids and replaced knee. It's a, nobody ever asks you, how do you want to identify? They just look at me and then depending on where I am in the U.S., I might be Italian or I might be, you know, uh, Spanish or something, nobody asks. They just either guess or they leave it blank. Ask people how would they like to identify, and I bet you you'll find out more than just, I'm an American Indian. You know, you can find out I'm two-spirit or whatever. Uh, you just don't know because nobody asks. Everybody's afraid. They're too PC. They don't want to ask or offend anybody. But ask them because how else are you going to take care of them correctly if you don't even know who's in front of you? So that's number one is ask Number two, at least find out who's in your catchment area, who this could possibly be, and find out, uh, like in Vancouver, they don't smudge, they don't do sweats, don't offer that, you know, you might ask for something else. So, and um, I don't know, if we can at least get that far, know who's in your area and ask people how they want to identify and it's there, and it's in the U.S., and nobody ever does. So we have terrible numbers over here. There's bad numbers up there as well, um, but they're actually worse because people don't ask. So we only know the numbers where people ask, <laughs> but most of the time they don't. And so our life expectancies are actually much worse. Our cancer registries are worse. You know, HIV, COVID, it's all worse, and it's already bad because people don't even ask. That's the simplest thing anybody could do is start asking, you know, who are you? What do I need to know to take care of you? Is there someone else I should talk to besides and so forth? Thank you so much, Margaret. That is so good. And I'm actually going to take that forward to some of the committees that I sit on um, in terms of teaching our students, because we do teach them communication. We teach them how to communicate with patients. And how great would it be if the first question you ask is not, uh, what have you come to see us for today, <laughs> as we have taught in the past, but rather, how would you like me to address you today? How would how how do you identify today? And and that's uh, and, uh, that's something I am taking away and uh, will definitely bring to some of the tables that I sit on. Um, so thank you for that. And I'll tell you a real quick anecdote about that. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm in Vancouver. Uh, suddenly, I got terrible vertigo. It just wouldn't stop. It just went and went. This happens like every ten years or so. And I just couldn't get a grip. So I actually called the ambulance. They took me down, maybe, you know, IV, uh, or Dremamine, whatever it was, in some Ativan or something. I don't know. I'm lying there in that ER bay for a long, long time. And right at my feet, like above me, I can see it staring at me. We have an American Indian program, blah, 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 blah. No one ever asked me. Nobody mentioned that. Nobody. I'm staring at it the whole time thinking, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so it's like, even when people have these programs, navigator programs, cultural programs, specific, I guess it wasn't American Indian over there, but, you know, 
indigenous, whatever it was. It's this huge poster hanging from the ceiling, staring at my bay particularly. No one ever asked me who I am, what I am, what did I need? And and I wouldn't have needed it, but no one asked. So that so even when people can check off, oh, we have this cultural navigator, we have this, we have that. It's no good if nobody asks who you are and do you need it. Yep. We need to stop just treating those things as some checkbox to tick off, but, but mm -hmm. more like something to actually practice and, and like you said ask, ask people and talk to people and uh well margaret this is body banter after all and we would not end without asking you um our question that we'd like to ask all our guests guests mm -hmm. to you uh do you have any favorite part of the body I don't know if I have a favorite part, but I would think that maybe this is an odd answer, probably, but the trunk, only because I have had so many people missing limbs and so forth, but they're still there, and the soul and the heart and the spirit are here, even if, let's say, you get dementia or you lose limbs and so forth. So to me, that's the solid part. That is so sweet. <laughs> Go ahead, that is, Claudia. <laughs> that is so beautiful. Um, you're the first one to give uh, such a philosophical answer to this wow. question. Um, an entire body region. And, of course, you integrated all of the things that you talked about. So, thank you. That's um, I will carry that forward as um, a way of viewing the trunk. So... What's your least favorite body part? Oh, least favorite. Gosh, I don't know if I have a least favorite, so I'll just have to to leave you with that last. I don't, I really don't. I don't. Not going to commit to that. I love it. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Um, yeah. And again, because, and I don't think I really got into this, and I won't. But the spirit is in every little part, and that's why sometimes you will hear indigenous people ask for their appendix back for their hair back their nail clippings uh placenta etc because the spirit is in everything so there's nothing to not like i guess that makes total sense margaret it's been a real treat to have you on the podcast thank you so much i've learned so much um i think i've grown just by listening to you yeah. um you've again broadened my horizon as you have in many of the hours that we spent together here at UBC. Um, thank you for being amazing. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, and we wish you all the best. And um, yeah, we'll do what we can to amplify your voice and the voice of others. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank I, you for having me. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, that wraps up another episode of Body Banter. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>